this is a, an extremely complicated topic and one that feelings tend to run rather high on. Uh, and uh, I will touch on a number of aspects of it, but by no means all. Uh, please feel free, I'm sure I need hardly say this, uh, to, re to uh, open up the discussion to many other topics that could have been discussed uh, in the subsequent discussion period. Uh, there are two main foci of the remarks I want to make. One has to do, and the primary one, as in all the talks I'm giving here, has to do with American foreign policy, what the United States has been doing. I don't think there's any need to explain why that should be our primary concern in any event that's mine. Uh, uh, the other topic, and one that's closely related to that, it turns out it was the subtitle, I think, of the announced topic, the question of Palestine. And I want to say some things about the way in which the United States has acted to uh, deal with the problem of Israel and the Palestinians. And in fact, that problem, I'll say something about that problem itself as I perceive it. Now, those are the major foci of these remarks. Uh, as far as United States foreign policy is concerned with regard to the Middle East, a good place to start is to take a look at uh, the coming year, the projected military budget for fiscal year 1983, the recently announced projected military budget. If you look at the top military aid recipients from one down, they are in, in order the following. First, Israel. Second, Egypt. Third, Turkey. Fourth, Spain. Fifth, Greece. And sixth, Pakistan. Those are the top six recipients of military aid. Well, there are a number of interesting things about the list, uh, and if there's time later, we can talk about some of them. But one obvious thing about the list is that every one of those uh, top recipients uh, is either in the Middle East or is aimed toward the Middle East. Uh, the aid to Spain, for example, uh, is directed towards, uh, towards the Middle East, uh, and uh, uh, same with, with Pakistan. Uh, the other countries, uh, and same with Greece, uh, and the other countries are in the Middle East. That gives you a fair measure of the significance that the Middle East has played, uh, plays now, and in fact has played throughout in the design of American post-war policy. Uh, it gives actually an unfair measure because if we looked at the American military budget itself, uh, for example, the rapid deployment force and even the strategic nuclear forces, which are largely to be understood as a mechanism for permitting the conventional forces to be used, we'll find that to a very significant extent, here it's hard to give numbers, but certainly to a very significant extent, these two are directed towards the Middle East, towards the Arabian Peninsula, in fact. Uh, and this, the measure of, this measure of current significance of the Middle East and American foreign policy could be taken way back to the beginning, uh, to, since to the Second World War, to the time at which the United States became you know, a major operator on, the globe, on a global scale, Second World War and since. Uh, the motive, pr the primary motive is obvious to everyone, it's oil. Uh, by the late 1930s or the early 1940s, it was understood widely uh, in the industry and in the government that the major cheap uh, accessible resources of energy for a long time to come, for 50 or 100 years, uh, would be the Middle East, primarily the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, an American uh, State Department um, uh, policy paper of, I think, 1944 or so. Uh, incidentally, where I don't give specific references here, you could, I think, just about in every case, find them in Towards a New Cold War, the book that was mentioned. I won't speak with footnotes. Uh, the, this uh, policy paper, which I believe was about 44, described Saudi Arabia as a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the great material prizes in world history. Uh, which was a fair assessment of the way in which this was understood at the time. And it was plain that the United States was not going to permit this great strategic prize to get out of our hands. Uh, uh, if there's time later, I'll go into it in more detail, but let me just briefly say that uh, one subcurrent that was going on in the midst of the Second World War was the American, successful American effort to slowly edge England out of substantial parts of its uh, Middle East, uh, the control over Middle East oil. Uh, and in the period immediately following the Second World War, this continued. Uh, France and England were consistent with their power relative to the United States, were pretty much driven out of uh, large parts of the Middle East, and it largely fell into American control. I'll come back to details if you like. Uh, 
No, it was obvious at the time, and it's been obvious since, that whoever controlled this stupendous resource would have a very effective role, a major role, in organizing and controlling uh, the world system, and uh, the, a good deal of American policy has been designed towards ensuring that this will be the case. Now, the rhetoric at the time and since was rather different. The rhetoric always uh, referred to defense of the Middle East against the Soviet Union. And today, for example, when we have a rapid deployment force, this is presented to the American public, where it's presented at all, as, uh, um, as a defense against uh, the Soviet invasion or something. Uh, that has never been the purpose of these uh, military expenditures, nor has it ever been our major concern that the Soviet Union would develop a, 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 major, a major degree of influence or, or major power or control in that region. That's never been in the cards, and it's not in the cards now. Uh, it's a disguise, uh, and the disguise is pretty transparent. Uh, the, the real threat to American control of these regions are indigenous radical nationalist movements, primarily, and secondarily, the European powers, who are real competitors. Uh, and in fact, uh, a very significant fact about contemporary history, really contemporary, relating both to the Middle East and to other parts of the world, is the growing conflict between the United States and Europe, uh, the United States and Europe and Japan, uh, uh, which is, I believe, much more serious, a much more significant fault line, if you like, in the international system than the uh, the one established by the Cold War ideology. Now, the exploitation of the Cold War to justify military and other kinds of maneuvers directed against radical nationalism, indigenous rational, radical nationalism, or against potential rivals like the Europeans, that is standard throughout the Cold War period. And the use of it in, in the Middle East is simply a special case. Again, I'll give more comment on this if you like later on. Well. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that control over oil has been the primary issue always lurking in the background and not very far in the background as far as American policy towards the Middle East is concerned. Nevertheless, the immediate issue on the front pages uh, is, and for a long time has been, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And that's understandable enough. For example, there's, there is right now a good deal of concern voiced on the editorial pages and in the news columns uh, that over Israeli warnings that PLO provocations will lead to a large-scale military attack on Lebanon. Uh, this apparently has, uh, an uh, Lib Israeli Lib attack on Lebanon has come pretty close, uh, almost happened in the last several months. Uh, for example, a couple of months ago, three Palestinians were caught attempting to enter the West Bank from Jordan, and that apparently almost came very close to precipitating an Israeli attack on a military, a big large-scale invasion of Lebanon. Uh, the United States has been pressing Israel to refrain from military action in Lebanon, and the, the reason for this is uh, a perfectly understandable fear that such an attack could lead to a general war in the region. In fact, it's very likely to, uh, and, furthermore, and that war could easily get out of hand very quickly, could lead to a superpower confrontation, and in fact, could lead to a nuclear war. There's no place in the world where nuclear war is more likely to break out, in my view, uh, than right there on the Lebanese border. And I think that's well understood. I think we're only a few minutes away from nuclear war because of those confrontations. You can easily see how that can happen. An Israeli attack on Lebanon will probably, very probably, involve Israel in some military confrontation with Syria, which is getting its military support from the Soviet Union. If the uh, Israeli military forces prevail, as is very likely, uh, that could very well lead to some sort of Soviet act in support of Syria, uh, which would immediately bring the United States in, and that's the end. Uh, this is very, very close. Uh, it's understood by planners, and this is the reason why the United States has been pressing Israel very hard not to attack southern Lebanon, and why the rest of the world, at least the ones with some degree of sanity, have their fingers crossed on this issue. Uh, the uh, UN, There are UN peacekeeping forces, as you know, in southern Lebanon, uh, and uh, remember, those are essentially European forces, and in fact, generally rather pro-Israel, uh, and have historically been so. The UN peacekeeping forces in southern Lebanon have, have, described, have discussed Israeli charges about the PLO activities in southern Lebanon, and they've described them as, in their words, exaggerated generally. Now, UN officials in southern Lebanon, there is a peacekeeping force, remember, UNIFIL, which controls part of southern Lebanon on the border. 
uh, this peacekeeping force and UN officials in Lebanon have also issued, issued a series of uh, rather different reports about what's been going on there. And those, to my knowledge, have been reported only once in the American press, namely in an article by Robin Wright, who's the Christian Science Monitor Beirut correspondent. And she had an article in the Christian Science Monitor on uh, March 18th of this year, which, as far as I'm aware, is the only reference to these rather important uh, UN uh, reports, which I will now describe. Uh, uh, right, uh, according uh, the, the United Nations uh, reports state that uh, PLO actions in southern Lebanon are, quoting, nothing compared with Israeli provocations. Uh, they say that Israel ap appears to have launched a campaign of what they call brinksmanship shadow boxing in an attempt to bait the Palestinians into provoking a confrontation in southern Lebanon, which would give Israel the pretext to invade. This view is held by UN officials uh, and also by Western diplomats in Beirut, uh, who also recall all of them tend to be basically pro-Israel. Uh, this provocation campaign began in January. It began after the virtual annexation of the Golan Heights by Israel, and in particular after this failed to elicit uh, any reaction uh, other than rhetorical from the Arab states. Immediately after that, according to the United Nations uh, forces in Lebanon and Western diplomats there, the, uh, the provocations began and they included the following examples, uh, among others. First, uh, heavy firing by Israeli forces, which are stationed in southern Lebanon, uh, in what are called training exercises. Second, tanks were introduced into southern Lebanon in what are called training exercises, an action which the United Nations called, and quoting, in intensive, excessive, and provocative, but which failed to elicit a Palestinian response. On February 8th of this year, Israeli, an Israeli military convoy entered Lebanon uh, and deployed at the point of the expected invasion site. Uh, there's one that's standard invasion site, and these forces deployed there, uh, in viola explicit violation of United Nations resolutions. Uh, and they stayed there, and then they left after failing to elicit a uh, Palestinian reaction. On March 8th, 300 Israeli military vehicles deployed in southern Lebanon, again at the point of the uh, uh, plausible invasion site, again in violation of UN resolutions, and again failing to uh, draw a PLO reaction. On January 25th, Israeli warships intercepted seven Lebanese fishing boats inside Lebanese territorial waters, and sank two of them. Uh, further incidents of this sort are reported in, cited in United Nations reports of February 10th and February 16th involving Israeli and Haddad forces. This is the Israeli surrogate forces in, in Lebanon. According to Wright, United Nations, if I'm quoting now, United Nations officials are angered to the point of publicizing recent incidents, hoping it will check the provocation. At the same time, they praise the PLO's, quote, unusual restraint. End quote. This is the drift of her article. I urge you to take a look. It's an important article. Uh, there are a number of interesting points to make about it. One is this. Uh, we might ask ourselves what the reaction would be in the United States if two Israeli fishing boats were sunk by Palestinian, by Palestinians in, say, off the coast of Tel Aviv in, uh, in Israeli territorial waters. Suppose that that had happened. What would the reaction be? Well, I think you know what the reaction be, it would be. It would be, first of all, a front page headline in every newspaper uh, and an editorial denouncing the bestial behavior of these uh, neo-Nazi monsters. Uh, and then there would be a comment on the uh, violent Israeli retaliatory response, which is regrettable but so understandable. Now, that's the way the response, that's the way it would be reported. It's no laughing matter. Uh, it was not reported, it was not dealt with in that way in this case. Uh, the sinking of two Lebanese fishing boats inside Lebanese territorial waters by Israeli warships, in fact, was not even reported. Uh, and the single report of it was simply a mention, just one of those facts. Uh, this is rather typical. Uh, Israeli gunboats regularly shell Lebanese cities, like the city of Tyre, uh, and uh, this is often not reported at all, or if it's reported, uh, you'll find it mentioned, buried inside an article on some other topic. There may be a line saying, today, 
Israeli gunboats shelled uh, the Palestinian city of Tyre, a Lebanese city to be precise. Uh, that's again typical, and this is, uh, this is quite typical also of reporting from the West Bank. Uh, in the last couple of months, there has been fairly extensive reporting of the treatment of Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. The reason there's been fairly extensive reporting is that people are being killed. And when people are killed, the reporters often go out and describe what happens. Uh, but if you want to really understand what goes on in the West Bank, what you should, you, should, you should develop a technique for reading the newspapers. And one of the t techniques is that the important news is usually at the end of the column, the things that people don't look at usually. And that the reporter may not think is important, uh, but they usually are important. And that's true in this case, too. If you read these reports to the end, uh, you know, the beginning of the report says two Arabs shot in, you know, somewhere. Uh, read it to the end, and you find the typical treatment of Arabs. It's not shooting them. Killing Arabs is not the typical treatment. But the typical day-to-day -day treatment that goes on all the time and is reported on the occasion when somebody's killed, that's what's significant. And you find that if you read carefully. So, for example, David Schipler of the New York Times, who got to the West Bank to describe what was happening, those people were being killed. If you read his reports carefully, you find things like the following. Uh, this was on March 21st, the end of an article. He says that Israeli settlers, not soldiers, shot an 18-year-old boy and captured another uh, teenager after they alleged that somebody, not them, but somebody else had thrown a stone at their car. Uh, the one that wasn't shot, who was just caught, he was beaten. Uh, he was locked into the trunk of their car. They then drove him to Shiloh, where they live, uh, locked him in a room, beat him all day, took him to the Israeli military police, at which point the boy was detained and they were released. Now that part of the, that's the last paragraph of the story. That tells you what it's like. That tells you what a military occupation is like. And that tells you what the armed, largely religious settlers are like. It tells you much more about what's going on on the West Bank than the occasional shootings which, uh, which meet the headline. These are, this is the regular treatment, and the Israeli press is absolutely full of it, the Hebrew press in particular. If you want a short selection of excerpts, uh, the book of mine that was mentioned has a brief sub-selection of excerpts from the Hebrew language press, which is a very good press, I should say, as I point out there, much more open than ours, and reports this kind of thing with great regularity. It's a very systematic pattern. It's been going on for many, many years. Uh, and that's much more significant than the, than the things that hit the headlines. Uh, it does reach the papers here, but... Uh, only under unusual circumstances, like the ones of the last few months. Well, uh, this last example, as I say, is unusual primarily in that it's reported. And again, we could ask ourselves what the reaction would be if the situation were inverted. Suppose, for example, that uh, just run the story the other way around. Suppose that, uh, that Jews had been treated by Arabs that way. Would it also be buried without comment at the end of a report? Uh, well. Uh, the same question can be asked in many, many cases. Uh, for example, in uh, late April, April 21st, I think, uh, Israel, in fact, did carry out fairly heavy bombing of what are called Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Uh, Twenty-five people were killed, most of them Lebanese civilians, most of them apparently killed on nearby coastal roads. This uh, bombing was in response to what Israel called a provocation. The provocation was that an Israeli military vehicle hit a landmine in southern Lebanon, inside southern Lebanon, uh, and one soldier was called and in re killed, and in response to this PLO provocation came the bombing, which I described with 25 people killed. Uh, there was, uh, uh, this, again, roughly the same story was replayed on uh, May 9th. Uh, again, a bombing with this time 16 or so people killed, and the provocations were sort of similar. Well, again, you can ask yourself what the what was the reaction in the American press at that time? Well, the reaction, for example, was a, an editorial in the Washington Post that said that uh, this is not a time for sermons to Israel. This is a time to understand Israel's anguish and to mourn the, uh, you know, the people who are lost and so on. Again, ask yourself what would have happened if it had been reversed. Suppose that a Palestinian guerrilla stepped on a landmine in northern Israel uh, and in response for this provocation, the Palestinians shelled Israeli towns, killing 25 people. What would the response be in the American press? Well, you know what it would be. Uh, yeah, you think so? Uh, 
the answer to this question, right, the answer to this question is very important for Americans. I mean, it's important for the victims too, but it's also important for Americans to ask why this difference. And I think uh, if you ask it, I think you will conclude, at least I do, that this is an exhibition of a very deep-seated racism in the United States. Uh, in fact, of all the, there's plenty of racism of all sorts. Most of them are regarded as illegitimate. That is, you may feel them, but you're not allowed to express them. There's one form of racism, however, which is still regarded as perfectly legitimate and perfectly proper to express, and that is anti-Arab racism. And the press is full of it uh, in the most disgraceful and disgusting fashion. The examples that I've described are cases, but there are many others. Uh, every time there's been an oil price rise in the last 10 years, there have been caricatures of Arabs in the American press, which look like they come out of Hitler newspapers, anti-Semitic characters, uh, and the phrase oil sheiks, you know, has become part of the American lexicon, uh, who are sort of gouging the West and trying to take away what we have and so on. The fact of the matter, as anybody who even comes near understanding these affairs has pointed out, that the price rises uh, have been largely overwhelmingly, in fact, initiated by Venezuela and Iran, uh, not by the Arab sheiks. Uh, and in fact, that Britain uh, has, in fa has charged higher prices for its, the oil it produces than the oil sheiks always, you know, since the beginning. Uh, but none of, and, and another fact is that the United States largely welcomed for a long time and in fact uh, lay, put a floor under the, under the oil price. All of this is well known, but it doesn't, as, as in the case of, say, say, Nazi anti-Semitic propaganda, it doesn't affect the portrayal of the facts, which is there for other reasons. Uh, all of these things form an amalgam, and that's worth one that's worth thinking about. I'll give many other examples if you like. That's point number one about these UN reports. Second report is that, uh, as I've mentioned, the Israeli provocations and the United Nations reports about them did not appear in the American press, despite the UN efforts to publicize this rather important fact. Notice it is rather important. These are things which could quickly lead to nuclear war. They're not insignificant. Nevertheless, they were not reported, with the exception that I mentioned. And in fact, to be absolutely precise, there was also an article by Alex Coburn in the Wall Street Journal citing the Christian Science Monitor reports. To my knowledge, that's the only report of them. Uh, uh, this, and uh, this, this is, again, quite typical of the uh, press, and it's also true of the scholarly literature in this case, I should mention, where you'll find quite a lot about over the, over the years about Fedayeen attacks and Palestinian terrorism, but you'll find very little about Israeli actions. And where there is a description of Israeli actions, they're described as retaliation. Now, that's something that requires some thought, too. Uh, and I think if you look into it, you will discover that the terms terrorism and retaliation are not descriptive terms. They're ideological terms. Uh, they're terms of ideological interpretation. The fact that, and you, you find that as soon as you look at any particular incident. Each particular incident had its predecessor. And from the point of view of the people who are perpetrating it, it's retaliation. Uh, from the point of view of the victims, it's terrorism. Which is true? Well, depends very much on whose ox is being gored. If you really look at the cases, you can't give an answer. Let me give you a couple of the cases, and you can think about them. There's no, I'll never take them back to their origin, because there is no origin. As I said, everyone has its predecessor. Uh, the, the first major act of Palestinian terrorism uh, in, in Israel was in 1954, when uh, a, a, a Bedouin terrorist group from the Azazma Bedouin tribe ambushed a bus and killed, I forget how many, somebody will remember, maybe a dozen or 15 or so Israelis were killed in this attack on the bus. In response to this, Israel retaliated. Uh, the Israeli army attacked the Jordanian village, a Jordanian village where dozens of people were murdered. The Jordanian village had nothing to do with the bus attack and nobody ever claimed that it did. Uh, well, that was retaliation. The, the Bedouin attack was terrorism. However, there's something before the Bedouin attack. Uh, several things. One of them is that the, peop the Bedouin terrorist group was organized from a Bedouin tribe, the Azazma Bedouin, which was forcefully driven out of their lands uh, in 1950 by the Israeli army when the Israeli army was clearing out the demilitarized zones and driving out the population in violation of UN orders and censored by the, censured by the UN for doing so. Uh, something many thousands, I think about 7,000 Bedouins at that time were driven out of their lands uh, and out of that by force, 
And out of that came, uh, after that came this uh, terrorist group which carried out the attack that I mentioned. Uh, there was also an Israeli attack on the El Bureg refugee camp in which several dozen people were killed. There was the attack on Kibya in 1953 in which 66 or so uh, perfectly innocent villagers who had nothing to do with anything were killed in an attack. So there are many things that came before. Well, something came before them too, you know, and we could go back further. Well, what was terrorism and what was retaliation? These are not descriptive terms. These are terms of ideological interpretation, and we find that whenever we look. Uh, I can go on with this if you like, but I make the point and urge you to think about it. Uh, the scholarly literature, however, like the media, accepts a particular ideological interpretation, virtually without exception. There are few exceptions, but not many. Uh, the interpretation is Palestinian terrorism and Israeli retaliation. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter, when you look, is that matters are not that simple at all. I mentioned one case, there are many others. In the early 1950s, for example, I think there's very little doubt that a substantial part, probably the overwhelming bulk of the terrorist activity, was in fact initiated by Israel. It's differed in different periods. Uh, oh, hundreds and hundreds by, by bombing. I mean, it depends how far back you want to go. I mean, for example, the Kibya massacre, dozens and uh, the El Bureg attack in 1953, long before there was any PLO or any Palestinians. And we could go back further if you like. Uh, but uh, well, why don't you save that for the question period and then we can go on. Uh, but uh, what, what, I say, uh, what I say is that there is a particular ideological interpretation and that is the one that dominates the scholarly literature. Uh, it also does so with regard to the uh, uh, so-called uh, Fedayeen attacks. Uh, the, in fact, the fact of the matter is that uh, if you look at the scholarly literature, you, uh, at the, at, if you look at the documentary record, which is usually excluded from the scholarly literature, you will find, for example, important books, like, for example, a book published in Hebrew by the Israeli Arabist Ehud Ya'ari, who's a, a Labor Party Arabist, uh, which is a collection of documents captured by the Israeli army uh, in 1956 when they invaded the Sinai. Uh, and these documents demonstrate uh, something which had already been pointed out based on Arab sources, uh, namely that the Egyptian forces prior to that time were trying to quiet the border uh, in fear of an Israeli attack, and that uh, they went even to the extent of withdrawing Palestinians from the, uh, it was long before the PLO, remember, uh, withdrawing Palestinians from border units because they were afraid that they might do something which would provoke an Israeli attack. Uh, in contrast, Israel was trying to heighten tensions on the border and was doing things like sending letter bombs into the Gaza Strip to kill off successfully uh, uh, Egyptian officers who were trying to calm down border tensions. That's what the Egyptian documents demonstrate. But you're not going to find that in scholarly literature, uh, just as you won't find evidence from the Pentagon Papers appearing in the American scholarly literature about Vietnam. Some things are too important to discuss. Uh, as far as the Lebanese uh, as far as the matter of Lebanon is concerned, exactly the same is true. Uh, I mentioned things which are not now being reported on the press, with the exception mentioned, concerning Israeli provocations, efforts to bait the Palestinians into provoking an Israeli attack in southern Lebanon. But it's a little unfair to dump on the press in this respect because, uh, in fact, again, the scholarly literature doesn't present the background of any of this. And the background is interesting and important and worth knowing. For example, it's worth knowing that in the mid-1950s, from the mid-1950s, uh, the state of Israel has seriously considered at the highest level uh, uh, the a pl plans to uh, dismember Lebanon and to take over southern Lebanon and incorporate it in the state of Israel. This, for example, was discussed at the, in the, the highest cabinet level uh, back in around 1955, and it was a position that was explicitly, quite clearly and explicitly advocated by David Ben-Gurion who thought the sort of main nationalist figure at the time, who and premier off and on, uh, who, uh, uh, who uh, proposed that uh, Israel devote substantial resources to uh, uh, breaking up Lebanon and separating off southern Lebanon and incorporating it to the state of Israel. His chief, he was minister of defense. His chief of staff, who at the time was Moshe Dayan, uh, made the following rather remarkable proposal in the light of future events. Diane suggested that, I'm quoting now, the only thing that's necessary is to find an officer, even just a major, 
we should either win his heart or buy him with money to make him agree to declare himself the savior of the Maronite, that's the Christian Maronite population. Then the Israeli army will enter Lebanon, will occupy the necessary territory, and will create a Christian regime which will ally itself with Israel. The territory from the Latani, the Latani River southward, will be totally annexed to Israel and everything will be all right. Well, that was 1955. This, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, and that uh, notice is an almost precise description of what's going on now, even down to the level of the major. They bought, it was a, a, a Mar Christian Maronite major, Major Haddad, was installed in southern Lebanon in 1978 in violation of UN resolutions. Uh, a Christian Maronite force was brought in from the north through Israel and implanted in place there. And about everything that Dayan proposed has happened, except that yet uh, the Israeli army has not invaded to occupy the territory from Litani South. That's in the cards, I think. Uh, you asked about the source. The source is another very important book, so important that, again, it is completely excluded from the scholarly literature, to my knowledge, namely the diaries of Prime Minister Moshe Sharet. Moshe Sharet was the Prime Minister of Israel at that time, uh, from up till 1956, in fact, uh, and uh, he was sort of a dove, and he didn't like, he was opposed to the constant provocations and terrorism and violence that was being incited by the State of Israel. He was very much opposed to that. And there's detailed discussion in his diary about this. He lost out on all the discussions, but he wasn't happy about it. Uh, there's a very important discussion of Kibya, of the Israeli terrorist activities in Egypt, aimed primarily at American installations to try to embitter relations between Egypt and the United States uh, at the, uh, uh, well, this, the, uh, this Lebanese business and so on. That's important primary documentary material. Uh, it's been available for a long time. It's even available, parts of it are even available in English now in a booklet by Olivia Rokach, a former Israeli journalist now in Italy. Uh, and uh, again, that's important material so important, again, that it's excluded from the scholarly record, so it's not too surprising if journalists don't know it. Uh, but it's important for understanding the backgrounds of what's happening now. Now, in fact, these plans were, if to continue the story, these plans were put into abeyance in 1956 uh, for a very good reason. In 1956, Israel, France, and England joined in an attack on Egypt. And uh, it was primarily American power which sort of forced them to retreat. The United States did not want to see France and England reassert their role, they, you know, reassert their position in the Middle East at that period. Uh, that was at the time of the Suez Crisis. Uh, from 1956 to 1967, Israel and France had a very close alliance, military and otherwise. France had historically represented itself as the defender of Lebanon, and during the period of the French uh, Israeli military alliance, there is no doubt that these plans were put into abeyance. After 1967, however, the French-Israeli the French -Israeli alliance collapsed and the Israeli-American alliance became much closer. And at that point, it appears that the plans that had been discussed prior to this in the mid-50s were once again put into operation. That seems to be the right interpretation for what's been going on in the last couple of years. Uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, you can discuss it or argue about it, but I think just the facts I've mentioned make that plausible and many others like it. None of this is discussed. None of this is discussed in the media. None of it is discussed in the scholarly literature anywhere near the mainstream. Uh, and uh, I, I would uh, place that in the same context as the examples I mentioned earlier. It's not discussable because it doesn't fit ideological preconceptions. Uh, this leads to an, a very serious misunderstanding of the nature of what's happening there, which is important in itself and is in fact crucially important to us, uh, because, in, if only because uh, of the imminence of nuclear war, uh, which hinges very closely on developments in this region, as I mentioned. Uh, so even self-interest, let alone concern for the people there, ought to uh, motivate some effort to try to discover the facts about these matters, and they're not that hard to get at if you extricate yourself from mainstream scholarship and media and look at the documentary record, for example. Uh, what are the, that's the second point I wanted to make about these UN reports in Southern Lebanon. The third uh, re, uh, point I want to make has to do with the significance of the facts reported. Uh, an Israeli invasion is now not unlikely. 
I think it's very likely. It might have to do with domestic reasons connected with the return of the Sinai. Uh, more to talk about there, but I'll drop it. However, uh, you know, again, pick it up in discussion if you like. Uh, but one, but the, the consequence of the evacuation of the Sinai is likely to be, and I think we see it happening, an intensification of efforts leading towards annexation, ultimately, of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, and also probably some form of occupation of, the, of southern Lebanon. Now, there's good reasons for that. There are very good reasons for it. Uh, uh, the Lutani River, which is a big river by Middle East standards, uh, which runs north parallel to the Israeli borders, come up to the north, uh, is a largely, still largely unused water source. Uh, and water is a very precious commodity in that region, more important than oil. Uh, Israel, by now, uses its water resources to something like 100% capacity, very efficient use of its water resources, and it just doesn't have any more to tap. Uh, one of the few available water resources in the region is the Latani River, and there's just no doubt, I think, that uh, uh, Israel, uh, Israel, Israeli planners are thinking about that source and trying to figure out a way to uh, get control over it. To get control over it would mean not just moving up to the Latani, but moving up a good bit farther north, because it would be necessary to block off uh, possible damming and uh, diversion uh, farther from the source. So a lot is involved. Uh, uh, and in fact, you know, again, uh, this has been considered for many, many years, long before the period I discussed. And in terms of the geopolitics of the region, it's a, a natural expectation, and therefore I think one that we should expect to see, we would expect to see move towards for, for fulfilling it, and I've mentioned a few. Uh, the consequences, again, could very well be uh, uh, a, a major war, even a superpower conflict, and recall that in October, the last Israeli-Arab war in 1973 did in fact lead to an American strategic nuclear alert. came very close, and the next one could make the next step, and the last step. Well, um, let me say some things about the backgrounds of all of this, and exactly as in the case of terrorism, a discussion of the backgrounds will never go back far enough, because for everything that happened, there's a predecessor, obviously and it's important to know why. Just for the sake of time, I'll start at one particular point, recognizing that that had predecessors, namely the uh, aftermath of the, October, of the June 1967 war, so-called Six-Day War. Well, again, it's misleading to start there, but let's start there because that set the state of the region as it has existed since and, and determined the policy options that are available since for the United States and for Israel. Uh, in uh, 1967, you recall, uh, Israel conquered the Sinai, the West Bank, uh, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip. Uh, now, uh, just to go, well, I said I wasn't going to go back, but let's put that in context. In 1947, at Lake Success, the British mandatory territory was partitioned. Uh, it was partitioned into two parts, one which was to be a Jewish state and one which was to be a Palestinian state. A civil war erupted, it was fighting up and back. Uh, the uh, Jewish community was better organized and better armed and had taken a fair part of the territory of the Palestinian state through the civil war. That led to May 1948, when the state of Israel was uh, proclaimed. The Arab armies then entered the battle the day after the declaration of independence of the state, and more fighting went on almost all of it in the territory of the, of the designated Palestinian state, incidentally. That fighting ended with the Rhodes Agreement in December 19, in 1949, uh, and at that point the, the result, which was the armistice lines, had the Palestinian state divided roughly in half. Half of it had been taken over and was incorporated into Israel, and half of it was taken over by what is now Jordan and Egypt. So what happened as a result of that fighting was that the, uh, the Palestinian state designated in the United Nations report uh, was split roughly in half, half being part of Israel and half being part of then Transjordan and Egypt. Uh, that's a descriptive account of what happened. In 1967, the remainder of the Palestinian state was conquered as part of the general war that took place. Uh, in 1967, about 400,000 Arabs either fled or were expelled from uh, the occupied the territories that were conquered. Uh, 
And again, according to the United Nations Command, General Odd Bull, Norwegian, uh, as late as November of that year, uh, there were still Arabs being forcefully expelled from the West Bank. Uh, that's the background. Uh, immediately after the occupation, uh, Israel began to carry out uh, action. This was the labor government, recall. Began to carry out actions in the occupied territories, which led, which were leading slowly and increasingly towards their integration into the state of Israel. There is, as far as I know, one good book on this subject, only one that I've seen. It's a book by an Israeli journalist named Amnon Kapeliuk, uh, which was written in Fr French. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, there was a substantial effort to get an American publisher for it. I think it went through about 20 efforts, and it failed. But if you can read French, uh, this book is a very good, detailed account by an Israeli, good Israel, one of the best Israeli journalists of the policies that were undertaken from immediately after the, uh, uh, the uh, conquest in, in 1967. And I think it's fair to say uh, that these policies were uh, slow moves towards integration. Uh, ultimately, the logic of them is towards a form of annexation. Uh, simply to give one example, uh, the uh, commander of the West Bank, Chaim Herzog, uh, in 1974, gave an interview in Israel, in Hebrew, uh, in which he made the following rather interesting and revealing, uh, the, the following interesting revelation. Uh, he said that as commander of the West Bank in, I think, 68 or so, he had been approached by a group of conservative uh, pro-Jordanian notables, you know, sort of the aristocracy on the West Bank, the most the group that's called moderate, meaning the most reactionary group. Uh, he had been approached by them, uh, and uh, he had been asked by them to allow them to form an anti-PLO, uh, pro-Jordanian political grouping on the West Bank. Well, as the commander of the West Bank, he thought this was a terrific idea. In fact, it's typical for any occupying power anywhere to try to create a quizzling leadership which will do what it wants and control the population. That's absolutely standard. In fact, the Israeli occupation is, I think, the only case I know in which this wasn't tried at first. Uh, here was the case. I mean, here's the Quisling leadership nominating itself. Uh, an anti-Palestinian leadership of pro-Jordanian not notables on the West Bank asking to al allow them to be organized to function politically in the interest of the Israeli occupation. Well, Herzog brought that to the Israeli cabinet, and they rejected it. They rejected that idea, and what's more, they imposed censorship on him, uh, so he was not allowed to state it, and in fact, he was just revealing it then uh, in late 1974. Well, his interpretation, I suppose, or anyway, the interpretation is pretty obvious. Uh, Israel did not want even anti-Palestinian political organization to take place on the West Bank. They didn't want any political expression to develop on the West Bank in this early period. Uh, and I think that's an indication, one of many indications, of the extent of the commitment, which was not long in developing, towards finding some way to integrate these territories with the state of Israel. Well, out of these uh, discussions, uh, incidentally, recently, in very recent uh, months, Israel has changed policy on this and has tried to do what most conquering armies do, namely to create a quizzling leadership. These are the so-called village councils which apparently have virtually no credibility on the West Bank, but have a great deal of credibility in American newspapers, uh, where the people are called moderates, typically, meaning quizlings for our side. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, what is striking about this development is that it's so belated. This is what conquering armies usually do at once, and it's interesting that Israel is only now beginning to do it with the typical kind of applause in the American media that you'd expect when a client state does the kind of things we like. You know. uh, going back to the post-1967 period, uh, two, two basic plans you know, proposals developed within Israeli politics about how to deal with the occupied territories. Uh, one, each, uh, one is associated with each of the major political groupings. As you probably know, there's two major political groupings in the Israeli political spectrum. One is the one that's sort of around the now-governing Likud party coalition, 
uh, and another is around the sort of labor coalition. So I'll just call them Likud and the Labor Party. I mean, they fluctuate a bit in their composition, but those are the two main political groupings. And each of them had its sort of typical you know, policy that it slowly developed, evolved towards the occupied territories. The Labor Party policy uh, was what was later called the Alon Plan, named after General Yigal Alon. And the idea was uh, for Israel to take, to basically annex parts of the occupied territories. Uh, the Jordan Valley, uh, a big area around Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, everybody was agreed on that, uh, and various other areas, uh, but to avoid the areas of heavy Arab population concentration. The areas like around Nablus, you know, the sort of cities, you know, there's a heavy Arab population concentration on the West Bank. Those were not to be annexed by Israel, rather these would be excluded. And what was the status of those territories to be? Well, they would, of course, be under Israeli military control. Uh, but as far as the population is concerned, they could be Jordanian if Jordan would agree to have citizens under Israeli military control, or the people could just be stateless. Well, to be stateless is the absolutely worst status that human beings can have in the modern world. Uh, and one might describe this program as about the limits of cynicism. That's the way it has been described, incidentally, by Israeli doves, like General Matit Yahu Peled, of the, who was on the uh, general staff of the Six-Day War and has since emerged as a leading Israeli dove on pretty much tactical grounds. Uh, uh, and he has pointed out, and I think accurately, that the Labor Party position is the most cynical position that you can imagine with regard to this population. Uh, incidentally, it gets a very good press in the United States. It's considered very uh, forthcoming and uh, moderate and all good adjectives. Uh, but if you think through what it means, I think you'll notice, uh, you'll give a rather different interpretation. Uh, why uh, avoid the areas of heavy population concentration? Well, the answer is uh, that there is a problem which is euphemistically called the demographic problem in Israel. And that problem uh, is, to put it simply, how to deal with the fact that Israel is supposed to be a democracy, but a, a Jewish state, uh, which has non-Jewish citizens. That's tricky. In fact, it's a self-contradiction. It's as much a self-contradiction as it would be for the United States, let's say, to be a democratic white state with non-white citizens. That couldn't be. To the extent that it's a white state, it would be a non-democratic state. To the extent that it's being a white state was something, be, if the, be, it's being a white state was just symbolism, then it would be non-democratic at the level of symbolism. If it's being a white state was a matter of legal structure and administrative practice, then it's being a white state would be more than a matter of symbolism, it would be flat racism. We understand that very well in the case of a white state, and anybody who's capable of sort of the most elementary kindergarten logic which excludes most of the intellectual community, can immediately, see, can immediately see that by the very same argument, the very same argument holds of a Jewish state with non-Jewish citizens, which is aiming to be a democratic state. And I should mention, I'll give details if you like, uh, that in this case it goes well beyond symbolism. It goes to administrative practice and legal structure in a fundamental sense. This is a fact that American liberals have been required to deny, and they have vociferously denied it, and have convinced one another. And the fact that they are flouting the most elementary logic is irrelevant, as it usually is in propaganda campaigns. But try to think it through, and you'll see that that's the case. If you don't agree, raise a question. That's what a question period is for. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, the problem, this problem could be sort of swept under the rug as long as the non-Jewish minority was about 15%, as it is within the Green Line, the pre-67 Israel. Uh, on the other hand, if the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are occupied uh, and taken over, then the problem is very hard to sweep under the rug because the Arab minority is quite large. And given you know, demographic patterns, by, say, the year 2000, it might be 50%, and after that it'll be even higher which will drive Israel towards what the Israeli doves have always most feared, namely what they describe uh, as a situation like Rhodesia and South Africa. And in fact, that's exactly where it will drive Israel, no question, if it persists in this way. And they understand that and have been writing about it for years. Uh, so the Labor Party program was an effort to undermine, to abort that by 
solving the demographic problem by keeping the non-Jewish citizenry at, as a small minority rather than a growing minority or even a majority, hence the Alon plan. Well, that's one. The alternative plan developed by the Begin administration and the Likud party has been very clearly to move towards annexation. That was obvious at once, and it's by now obvious to every, it was always denied, but I think by now it's obvious to just about everybody. In fact, few people even bother to deny it. It's plain that the logic of the Begin plan, which was abetted by the Camp David Agreement, is to move towards annexation of the occupied territories, uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. They've already essentially annexed the Golan Heights, and the next step will be the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Well, that, uh, that's the second proposal. Uh, and uh, you notice that it differs from the Labor Party plan in that, according to this one, the Arab residents do become part of the state of Israel. Now, what happens then? Well, that's not easy to work out. And in fact, the government has been very, uh, and its ideologues have been kind of quiet about it. Uh, but if you want to get a picture I, uh, of what is implicit and what has occasionally become explicit, uh, one explicit version was uh, actually appeared in the New York Times, to my surprise, a couple of days ago in an article by Amos Perlmutter, who's a very well-known Israeli military historian and something of a hawk himself. Who, who you may recall, if you read the New York Times, as the author of a long article about General Sharon in the, in the magazine section a couple of months ago, and he's rather pro-Sharon in many ways. Uh, he has a, an, an article, like two or three, I think last Tuesday, a couple of days ago, uh, in which he uh, uh, states that General Sharon, the defense minister, who is emerging as the major figure uh, in the political figure in Israel and likely next premier, uh, he said that Sharon's plan is simply to expel the Arab population from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Well, uh, that's the most bold and explicit uh, and crass statement of it that I've yet seen. And uh, Perlmutter is in a pretty good position to know. As I say, he's a sort of hawkish military historian himself, close to Sharon. Uh, he's critical of this, incidentally. Uh, but uh, yes, I think that's correct. And I think it could happen in the context of a war. Uh, it, uh, if you want, I'll give you more evidence, but, but, any, but I think that's the logic of the program, and I think in the context of a war, it could be implemented. We'll talk about it more if you like. It's hard to see how else the dem demographic problem will be solved within the framework of the Begin program. Well, that's Israeli politics. These are the two main programs, and they reflected themselves in two different ways of treating the West Bank population, somewhat different. Uh, there was the way that was advocated, for example, by, by Moshe Dayan in accordance with the Labor Party policy, and that ha it's, it's logic, if you think about it. The logic of the Alon plan is that in the ar areas of Arab population concentration, the Arabs should basically be allowed to run their own affairs, okay, because they're not going to be incorporated into the state of Israel. That was the Dayan position, and that led to the elections of 1976. Uh, which are now being overturned, naturally, by the Begin government, because the logic of its program is that the Arabs should not be allowed to run their affairs in the areas of, uh, of their heavy population concentration. So there's nothing surprising about any of this to anybody who's bothered to think through the explicit logic of these positions as they've emerged over the years. Uh, so the plans being now carried out by Menachem Milson and uh, General Sharon which are basically an effort to forcibly subdue the population in the occupied territories and have created what the Israeli press typically refers to as a pogrom-like atmosphere in the occupied territories. Uh, that flows from the uh, intention to uh, incorporate these territories within the state of Israel. What will happen to the population? Well, that's another story. Why is Israel so concerned with the West Bank and the Gaza Strip? There are a number of reasons. Every state, incidentally, gives the same answer when, it's, when you ask why it's concerned about anything. Every state is concerned about anything because of security. Okay. Now that we've gotten rid of that sort of root, you know, uh, rote answer, let's look at the reasons. We can do that in any case, and we can look at it in this case. And the reasons are pretty plain. Uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip have a real function for Israel, and one that's going to be very hard to eliminate. One shouldn't think it's going to be easy. Uh, on the one hand, they, they provide, first of all, they provide a very, a very significant labor market. Uh, cheap labor from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip is now very significant in Israel. Whole segments of the Israeli economy by, by now can even function without the cheap labor, including incidentally child labor, that is brought in from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Well, again, these are facts that have been pretty well suppressed in the United States. 
and they're just beginning slowly to break out. First mention that I ever saw, there's plenty of it in the Israeli press, incidentally, plenty. Uh, but the first mention I've seen in the uh, American press, maybe I missed one, was in this week's New York Times book review, where Irving Howe finally noticed uh, in a book that he reviewed that uh, uh, there is child labor and coming in from the West Bank. Well, there is, and there's been plenty of it, and it's been amply reported in the press uh, for people who want to know the facts, and this is not insignificant. The total amount of cheap, underpaid, unorganizable labor is maybe, officially it's about 60 or 70,000, and unofficially it's higher, and it's significant. It plays the same kind of role in the Israeli economy that the so-called guest workers, nice Orwellian euphemistic title, play in the European economies. You bring in guest workers, namely you know people from Turkey or Yugoslavia or Portugal, and they do all the dirty work, and then you pride yourself on not being racist like those Americans because you don't have slums. Yeah, the slums are in Turkey or Yugoslavia or something. Uh, that's the way Europe maintains its moral purity. And Israel has uh, essentially uh, has drifted in the same direction. Incidentally, we do the same thing with Mexican laborers. You know, that's a, everybody plays the game. You know. In Israel, it's, with, it's the, Pal the Palestinians from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip have been playing this role, and it's a big one and a significant one. Uh, uh, well, uh, that's one. Secondly, uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, especially the West Bank, have been very important markets for Israel. That's not too well appreciated. It's a captive market. Israeli goods only can go there, and it's a substantial market. It's one of, you know, comparatively, I forget the exact numbers, but it's a substantial market for Israel. And in fact, it's even a, a means for Israeli goods to get into the Arab world. The point of the open bridges policy across the Jordan has been to allow commerce, which in part means transfer of Israeli goods into the Arab world through the medium of, of the West Bank, and that's been significant. And third, and I think most important, has been what I mentioned before, the question of water. Uh, by now, Israel derives a lot of its water from the West Bank, uh, maybe 30 percent or so. Uh, and um, uh, that's uh, very, very difficult to see how that'll change. I mean, Israel has no alternative sources of water. And I suspect its main reason for refusing to accept any kind of real autonomy, independence on the West Bank, will be that if there is such independence, it will lose its control over these water resources. Because any independent state, whatever it is, is going to control its own water. It's not going to send it off to Israel. And that'll be a very severe blow to, to Israel at this point. So these are reasons why Israel is, why both Israeli political groupings have committed themselves to essential control over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip understandable, but let's not delude ourselves about why. Uh, let's turn briefly now to American policy. How's American policy developed over this period? Well, again, uh, again, since 1967, there have been basically two plans. Uh, they're not the same as the Israeli plans, but they're two foci, let's say. One of them uh, has an official name. It's called the Rogers Plan, named after William Rogers, who was Secretary of State under the Nixon administration. And uh, the, the, the Rogers plan was uh, very close to what is basically the international consensus on this issue. The international consensus, an overwhelming international consensus on this issue, is that the, there should be a political settlement on something like the Green Line, the pre-Gen 67 borders with maybe some minor modifications, uh, with demilitarized zones and international guarantees and recognized borders and so on as a whole. Uh, kind of panoply of expressions which go along with that. And that's basically the Rogers Plan, announced in December 1969. Uh, there's a second proposal which has no name except mine. I think it ought to be called the Kissinger Plan. Uh, it was the plan pr t proposed and, e and, in it and implemented by Henry Kissinger when he took over control over, when he took over control of uh, Middle Eastern affairs in uh, fall of 1970, approximately. The Kissinger Plan was, in effect, that Israel should should simply occupy, continue to occupy all the territories then under military occupation. Uh, that was the Kissinger plan. Well, uh, a rather interesting development took place at that point, which again has been rather neatly suppressed in the American press. There's a nice, those of you who are interested in the way the propaganda system works might want to check this out and pay some attention. Uh, <clears throat> the, what happened had to do with Anwar Sadat. In 1970, fall of 1970, at the time when Kissinger in effect took over, uh, Sadat came into power in Egypt. And Sadat immediately moved towards uh, 
turning Egypt into the position of an American, offering Egypt to the United States as a client state and uh, entering into a peace treaty with Israel on the basis of the international consensus, as I just described it. In February 1971, uh, uh, Sadat uh, agreed to a proposal by Gunnar Yaring, the UN mediator, which called for a, uh, for a political settlement on the 1967 pre-June 1967 borders with recognized borders, with international guarantees, with the militarized zones, with this whole range of stuff. Uh, Israel responded by noting with gratitude that Sadat had offered a genuine peace plan in their words, but they said that they would not accept it. And in inter this is the Labor Party. And in internal party documents, you find that the Labor Doves, like General Chaim Barlev, stated that they could have peace now if they wanted it, but that if they held out, they could do better. They wouldn't have to return to the 67 borders. And the United States backed Israel in its refusal to accept peace, uh, and uh, uh, hence that plan fell through. Now, over the next year or two, uh, Sadat continued to make various efforts to try to get through to Kissinger that he wanted peace with Israel on this basis, and he wanted his Egypt returned to the position of an American client state. Uh, Kissinger basically wasn't interested. Either he didn't understand or he wasn't interested. It's hard to tell from his memoirs, I mean, which are so confused and muddled on this issue that it's hard to believe, uh, you know. Again, I have a review of it in the book, if you like. But clearly he didn't, he didn't accept it, either because he didn't understand or because he didn't want it. You, you decide which. Uh, and uh, so that kept warning that he was therefore going to have to go to war since diplomacy wouldn't work. Uh, and in fact, he did that. In October 73, he went to war. And to the great surprise of everybody, the Egyptian and Syrian armies did surprisingly well, uh, and in fact came very close to winning the war in the early stages. They really frightened, you know, caused a lot of fright and danger. Uh, and, after, and that sort of broke through, you know, dispelled the clouds a little bit, and Kissinger got the point, uh, and he uh, recognized that he could then accept Sadat's offer to uh, uh, be an, uh, an American client state, and he then entered into the razzle-dazzle shuttle diplomacy, which was all a complicated cover to make it appear that he was doing something, whereas in fact he was responding to Sadat's long-standing initiative uh, and uh, settling an interim arrangement in the Sinai, which would eliminate Egypt from the uh, Middle East conflict and allow Israel to continue its occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. That's the Kissinger diplomacy. Uh, well, uh, in January, uh, Sadat wasn't willing to accept that in January 1976, for, and there are many indications of that. For example, a crucial one in January 1976, the confrontation states, including Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria, um, backed by the PLO, in fact, I think just about every Arab state, uh, brought to the UN Security Council a proposal which called for a settlement, a political settlement, uh, uh, in accord with the international consensus. And now it was slightly different from the proposal that uh, Sadat had made in 1971. This was 76. It now included a Palestinian state in the territories removed from Israeli occupation. The Palestinians had become a force in, on the international scene in the intervening period. Uh, uh, that proposal was vetoed by the United States. Israel refused to attend the meetings. And in fact, the Israeli response, this was Prime Minister Rabin's government, the Labor Party government, was that officially that Israel would not have any, would not enter into any discussions with any Palestinian faction on any political issue. That was one point. Uh, and they would not enter into any discussions with the PLO on any issue, even if the PLO were to recognize Israel and were to abandon terrorism. That was the official position of the Israeli government. Uh, and uh, the United States correspondingly vetoed this proposal at the Security Council. Uh, that was January 76. Uh, things went on from there. In the fall of 77, November 77, Anwar Sadat made his dramatic trip to Jerusalem, at which, and at this point, it was impossible to keep it quiet anymore, uh, too dramatic. Uh, and uh, he made a proposal in Jerusalem, uh, which was worse from Israel's point of view than the peace treaty that he had proposed in February 1971. Why was it worse? because his proposal, I mean, I don't think objectively worse, worse from Israel's point of view, because in November 77, a big trip to Jerusalem, his proposal included a Palestinian state, whereas in February 1971, he said nothing about any Palestinian state. 
Well, the issue of the Palestinians is supposed to be the big stumbling block. But in February 1971, in Sadat's peace offer, it didn't even exist. You know? uh, and in 77, given the change in the situation, it did exist. Well, uh, that's where then came Camp David, and then uh, uh, since then, uh, the uh, United States has again con continued to support the basically the status quo. Uh, it is uh, these two positions have both been live. One, the position of implementing the international consensus, which the United States has consistently blocked and vetoed, and the other is supporting the Israeli occupation. That's the American plan. Well, the inter now let me find this picture that I just gave you has the merit of truth, but the demerit of on being inconvenient. Uh, correspondingly, when the media and scholarship present what has happened, they give a different picture, one which has the merit of being convenient, but the demerit of being false. And the picture is like this. Uh, the picture is that when uh, Sadat came into office, he was a typical warmongering Arab lunatic, and he went to war in October 1973, and he saw that he couldn't gain his ends by war. So therefore, under the kindly tutelage of Henry Kissinger and President Carter, he was gradually led away from his warlike, uh, ferocious stance and made to understand that negotiation and so on is the way to deal with this matter. That's the official picture. So for example, when Sadat was assassinated uh, last fall, if you look at, say, the New York Times, well, you find a big two-page spread by their Middle East specialist, Eric Pace, uh, describing, you know, the great events of Sadat's life. Incidentally, Sadat was a huge hero in the United States, and given the self-brainwashing of American journalism, they were extremely surprised to find, when they got to Egypt to find he wasn't a big hero in Egypt. In fact, nobody seemed to give a damn about him in Egypt. Uh, if they'd been trying to follow the facts, they would have known why, but, you know, a big surprise here, as you remember. Anyhow, there was a big spread about this in the Times, uh, and... Uh, the, uh, the, the inconveniently, you know, the, the facts that I just mentioned, as I say, were inconvenient, so therefore they're not there, you know. Uh, so that's peace offer in February 1971 isn't there, right? What's there is the official version that I just described. Well, you compare that with, say, the Israeli press. That's interesting. Uh, Haaretz, which is sort of the Israeli equivalent of the New York Times, you know, sort of main respectable journal, their obituary for, for Sadat, uh, says that in February 1971, Sadat made his famous peace offer, which was rejected by Israel. Well, that famous peace offer was, you know, is so non-famous that it doesn't even appear in the American histories or, uh, or journalism on the period. Take a look. And the reason, I think, is easy to discover. Well, these are roughly the facts. Uh, the point of the Camp David, uh, and as I say, since then American policy has been oscillating between these two options, basically, between basically the Rogers Plan, the international consensus, which now incorporates a Palestinian state, didn't in the early 70s, uh, and uh, the Kissinger, or some variant of the Kissinger Plan, according to current circumstances, which would mean uh, support for what Israel is evidently planning to do, some kind of annexation of the occupied territories. And I think the current administration, like its predecessors, is torn between these two options. And which one it will follow will depend on all sorts of things, including American public opinion, a matter to which I'll return. Well, uh, I'm almost to an end. I have a little more patience. Uh, let me say something about the motivation for American policy. Uh, here, I think there are a number of factors that one can identify, and you can argue about their weight. Uh, I'll tell you what I think their weight is, and you can decide what you think. Uh, one factor clearly is a domestic one. Uh, it has to do with public opinion. It's plainly a fact that uh, there's a highly articulate domestic pressure group which supports Israeli expansionism. This is a group of people who call themselves supporters of Israel. I think it's an extremely bad term. I'll use it, but first let me tell you why I think it's a bad term. Uh, it's a bad term because it's objectively false. The people who are supporting Israeli expansionism are not supporting Israel. What they're supporting is the moral degeneration and the ultimate destruction of Israel because that's going to be the consequence of these policies. So they have no right to the phrase supporters of Israel because, they, in fact, they're supporting something which is completely destructive and is extremely likely to lead to the destruction of Israel. <laughs> nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, I'll continue, I'll continue to use the phrase, but remember, I don't mean it. I'm using it the phrase because they use it. Uh, so there is a uh, highly articulate domestic pressure group of the supporters of Israel. Now, in the media and elsewhere, this is often called the Jewish lobby, and I think that's wrong. Uh, 
I don't think it has much to do with any Jewish lobby. Uh, I think it is, in fact, uh, differently, I think it's wrongly identified. I think if you discuss, what it really is, is uh, it's a complex lobby, but the central part of it, I think, is the, liberal, the articulate liberal intelligentsia. That's the part that I think is really at the center. Uh, and uh, it's a fact, I think, which I'll go into this in discussion if you like. It's getting late, so I'll skip it now. But I think it's a fact that after the smashing Israeli victory of 1967, the liberal intelligentsia entered into a new love affair with Israel. Prior to that, they didn't have it, but, after, but they really loved that victory, very excited by it. Uh, and the so-called support for Israel, I think, was contingent upon the Israeli victory. In my view, if Israel were to suffer a military defeat, that support would also disappear, but that's another story. Uh, but that's been the center of it, and that's, uh, we could talk about why if you like. Uh, you know, ask me why I think so if you want. Uh, but uh, uh, nothing like leaving loaded questions unanswered. Uh, the, uh, but descriptively, I think that's a plain fact, can be easily documented, and I've done it. Uh, the, uh, 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 this is the, what, what's the significance of this group? They don't have any real power, you know, like they don't control the economy or anything like that, but they do have a significant voice in the media. Uh, the liberal articulate liberal intelligentsia have a very powerful role in the media, uh, and as long as the positions they advocate are in accord with state policy, as they have been, uh, that role will be exercised, and it's had a very negative effect. Uh, one consequence of it is that discussion of the issues of a sort that is standard in Europe, and in fact standard in Israel itself, has been quite impossible in the United States. Anyone who tries to enter into the kind of discussion that is standard in Israel and in Europe will be subjected to the kind of vilification and abuse which those of you who are old enough will easily recognize is precisely what the Stalinist intelligentsia carried out in the 1930s. Very familiar. Uh, in its style and its lies and so on and so forth. Uh, and that has sufficed to prevent discussion of the issues. It has just frightened people off of discussing them. And this has been very negative for us uh, because important and crucial issues are excluded from public debate and popular pressures do not act in the, they don't enter into the balance of determining policy. And it's also very dangerous for Israel. And that point has been repeatedly uh, and insistently made by Israeli doves, again, people like General Peled, uh, who have pointed out that the cutting off of discussion in the United States by these means, which are very ugly, uh, has constrained, ha has had the effect that the real Israeli doves, not the Labor Party, who has nothing to do with it, but the real Israeli doves, like him, for example, get no support from the United States, and therefore Israel is constrained within the most, in his words, the most intransigent and dangerous and ultimately self-destructive policies. Of course, the alternatives simply get no public support in the United States. Uh, I think he's right in his analysis. He wrote this, in fact, after he had a, a, a tour in the United States. He then wrote about it, and it was an amazing. Here, here's a guy who's a general in the Israeli army on the chief of staff during the sixth, the, uh, on the general staff during the Six Day War, a guy who writes a regular military, a regular column of military and political analysis in one of the most right-wing Israeli journals, Ma'ariv, Mass Circulation Journal. He comes to the United States, he tries to give talks, and he's shouted down at meetings and called a traitor and a, you know, a Jewish self-hater and, you know, anti-Semite and so on and so forth. He was amazed, you know. Uh, and uh, he was beginning to understand what a well-indoctrinated, uh, 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 articulate intelligentsia can do when it controls uh, the media and uses all of its familiar techniques of abuse and libel and so on to stifle discussion of opinion, the discussion of important issues. It's worked very effectively here and it's been very negative in its consequences. Uh, that's one source of American policy. I think it's a minor source, but you can judge for yourself. There's another source of American policy, which in my view is much more significant, and that's geopolitical. Uh, if you look at the relations between Israel and the United States, they have been complex. It hasn't always been what it is now. In the early 1950s, they were quite strained. Strained to the extent that Israel was very much concerned that the United States might end up backing Nasser, who was in part an American creation effect, which is not well known, uh, that is CIA darling at the beginning. Uh, and uh, Israel was quite concerned that the United States might end up backing Nasser and ending up being opposed to Israel. This, in fact, was one of the reasons why 
Israel launched terrorist actions in Egypt in the early 1950s aimed at, say, bombing American installations and so on in an effort to poison Egyptian-American relations, the so-called Lavon Affair, for those of you who know that. Uh, that was part of the motivation for them. Uh, in 1956, relations were quite harsh. In fact, Eisenhower you know, really ordered Israel to evacuate the Sinai, as you recall. Uh, after that, they improved. Uh, and they improved for, all, for a very simple reason. Uh, the United States began to recognize Israel's value as a barrier to radical Arab nationalism, which was a threat against the Gulf monarchies. Now, the major concern of the United States, as I mentioned before, is control over oil. And that means control over the super reactionary uh, ruling groups that run the oil states and whose interests are really in the United States primarily. Now, we want to make sure that they don't get overthrown. They're not going to get overthrown by the Russians, but they could get overthrown by, by radical nationalist forces internally. There have been repeated coup attempts. They're very unstable societies and so on. Uh, Nasser, from the late 50s on, was regarded as a, you know, was in fact, not just regarded as the real spokesman for radical Arab nationalism. And in fact, by the early 60s, there was actually a war going on between, kind of a surrogate war between Nasser and Saudi Arabia and southern Yemen. Uh, and Israel was regarded by American intelligence as a barrier to Nasserite radical nationalist pressure. And that continued right through the Nixon administration. Uh, th when Nixon and Kissinger moved to the Nic Nixon Doctrine, you recall that this was based on the idea that since the United States could not directly police the world, didn't have the power anymore, we would do it through a network of surrogate states. And as far as the Middle East was concerned, that meant Iran, then under the Shah, and Egypt, and Israel two powerful states which would control that region and suppress radical nationalist pressures. That was the uh, point, and in fact, that was made quite explicit by people like, say, Henry Jackson, the main oil senator. You know, really, you can like what he says or not, but he knows what he's talking about. Uh, and he pointed out repeatedly that American power in the region was based on a triumvirate of Saudi Arabia, which had the oil, and Israel and Iran, the military forces which guaranteed control, American control over that oil. That's the way it stood. The Israeli victory in 1967 confirmed that alliance by Israel, you know, gave a smashing defeat. There was a smashing defeat of Nasser, and that strongly strengthened American power in the region and solidified the alliance. In 1970, it uh, went even further. Uh, in, in the fall of 1970, at the time of Black September, if you recall, uh, the Jordanian army began a real massacre of the Palestinians in Jordan, and the Syrians threatened to intervene at one point to protect the Palestinians, and the United States was very much concerned about that. In fact, Kissinger at his confirmation hearings in the Senate identified that as the most one of the most dangerous moments in world affairs. He said, barely reported here, but he correctly described it that way, and it was dangerous because it was regarded as a threat against the oil-producing regions again through by possibly overturning the Hashemite monarchy. This was fall of 1970. The United States was in no position to intervene. It was after Cambodia. The country was blowing up. I mean, the United States could not have intervened at that time. And Israel threatened to intervene for them. And that was regarded as a, and that stopped it. Uh, that was regarded as a major contribution to American power in the region. You can tell this from the memoirs of the participants, people like William Quant and others. Uh, and it, really solidified the American-Israeli strategic alliance, and in fact, it led to a substantial increase in American aid to Israel in the next year. And that's the way it went after that. Uh, this is the main geopolitical reason, I think, for the American so-called support of Israel, that is, support for a militarized Israel, which will serve American interests. That's what the support is for. Well, there were side benefits. Uh, for example, American penetration of black Africa was assisted through Israeli mediation in the mid-1960s. Uh, in fact, you know, some, uh, the main success of that was, uh, it was that year where General Mobutu uh, owed his power, it is alleged, to Israeli support subsidized by the CIA. Some of the cases didn't turn out too well, like Idi Amin and General Bokassa, but uh, <laughs> some did. Uh, in subsequent years, uh, uh, Israel was supplying arms to Rhodesia, as the commerce in violation of the international ban, as the American Commerce Department just announced a couple of days ago, again, silence in the press, uh, that in effect enabled the United States to avoid the ban to Rhodesia during this period. 
Uh, and something rather like that has been going on in Central America recently, Israel's arms to Somoza, uh, to El Salvador, to Guatemala, to Indonesia, and so on. Uh, well, those are the side benefits. Uh, so places where, say, the American government cannot provide arms to dictatorships itself, say, because of congressional legislation which bars it, they have been able to exploit the Israeli connection to get Israel to do it for them. And I think that's going to increase. And my suspicion is that will increase. We can talk about that. Well, finally, what about the current situation? And where does it go from here? A few words. Uh, again, there remains an international consensus. There remains the same international consensus that there has all along. It's the one I described. As far as the Arab states and the PLO are concerned, they've oscillated around it in various degrees, sometimes rejecting it, sometimes accepting it. Sometimes they've come very close to accepting it, in fact, totally accepting it, as, for example, in January 1976, as I mentioned, when the confrontation states and the PLO, in fact, advanced the international consensus in the Security Council to have it vetoed by the United States. Israel and the United States have consistently rejected the international consensus of the political settlement and have insisted on one or another form of integration and annexation. In this respect, the position of Israel is comparable to that of the rejection front within the PLO. The position of Israel and the United States is comparable to that of the rejection front within the PLO. Uh, the PLO is a broad national front, has all kinds of views, has a rejection front, which has a position exactly analogous to that of the United States and Israel, and it has another grouping, the Fatah, the sort of really mainstream grouping, which has moved from that position and has accepted in one or another form some elements of the international consensus. That's the way the thing is now. Cru the crucial factor, as always, has been the greatest strategic, stupendous strategic resource, the Arabian Peninsula and primarily Saudi Arabia. So far, Saudi Arabia has contented itself with various occasional murmurs of protest uh, with regard to Israel American support for Israeli expansionism. Uh, in general, it has continued to be quite supportive of the United States. Uh, whether that will continue to be true, I don't know. The main potential problem in this region for American power is two. One, there is the problem of radical nationalism. Uh, Saudi Arabia and many others feel that the best way to control it is by confining the Palestinians in a little mini-state on the West Bank, which will be contained by an Israeli-Jordanian military alliance. The United States continues to accept, in effect, the Israeli doctrine that the best way of confining and controlling Palestinian nationalism is by having a kind of a militaristic Spartan uh, state, namely Israel, which will be there to control it by force. Uh, a, a second danger is uh, the what's called the Euro-Arab dialogue. Uh, the European powers were pretty much edged out of the Middle East in the 40s and the 50s, and they've been gradually reconstructing their position slowly, not only in the Middle East, but specifically there. Uh, and one part of that has been the negotiations between the Arab states and the European, the European common market on a settlement of the Palestinian issue, and they basically have agreed. Uh, and their agreement is roughly along the lines of what I've called the international consensus. And that agreement has led to a continual slow but noticeable increase in the role of Europe in the affairs of the Middle East. Uh, you can tell that by contracts, by military contracts, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, that, I think, the United States will not tolerate. I don't think the United States here going into the future, I don't think, if this continues, as I expect it will, I think the United States will not tolerate inroads into its dominant position in the oil-producing regions by its main competitors, namely Europe and Japan, uh, based on their acceptance of the international consensus on this issue. So what will the United States do? Well, it's not going to go to war with Europe, uh, but it can do something simpler. It can preempt the European position. That has been, in fact, one of the major positions in the American planning spectrum anyway all along. It's, again, the Rogers plan, and that's perfectly consistent with the needs of American power in the region. And the United States can go back to that position, preempt the European, undermine the Euro-Arab dialogue, simply by taking the position that the oil producers want, and they would much prefer to be you know, American client states than tied up with Europe. I mean, they know that this is where the wealth is, and this is where the power is, and this is where they expect to end up when they get thrown out ultimately, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, so that's what they want, and, that's, uh, uh, and the United States could take that position. Suppose we do, then what? Well, the next question is, how will Israel react? How will Israel react if the United States shifts to something like the Rogers Plan? 
Well, you might think that Israel will just obey, because after all, it's, uh, it is really a client state, if the words have any meaning. The United States supplies something like, I think, about 25% of the Israeli budget now. And you might say, well, how could they refuse to do what we tell them? Well, the answer is they could. Israel is, a, from a military point of view, a very powerful state now. It's at the level of a major NATO power. And there are a lot of things they could do. Uh, to avoid this. Uh, they could carry out some adventuristic military act in the Middle East, which would, say, bring the Russians in in some fashion. And as soon as the Russians breathe in that area, the United States will be in in force. Uh, and, uh, well, we'll have a nuclear war or something. But in any event, uh, there, there will be a reconstruction of the alliance. And I'm sure, you know, I can't find, show you a document, but I'd be extremely surprised if Israeli planners aren't, haven't thought that through and haven't told it to Washington, or if Washington can't figure it out for itself. I'm sure they can. Uh, and that means, I think that briefly means that the, there are limits on uh, the extent to which the United States can constrain Israeli actions. We've turned them into a very powerful military state, which gives them freedom of action because they can threaten things like acts that would lead to nuclear war, which certainly the United States doesn't want. Uh, the, uh, what does that mean? Well, um, I think what it means is this. Uh, I, I would think if the United States shifts towards the international consensus and stops blocking it and vetoing it, uh, then Israel will make an assessment. The Israeli government will make an assessment of whether they ought to go along or whether they ought to conduct some kind of adventuristic action, which with even the danger of war or maybe nuclear war. And I think their decision will be based in part, maybe in significant part, on the state of American public opinion. That is, they will make some assessment of how the United States will react and how American public opinion will respond. Uh, and that brings us back to the main point, my main point at least, uh, and that is that once again, I think the uh, tremendous success in aborting debate and discussion and consideration of these issues in the United States may prove extremely dangerous and in fact may be a major contributor towards a nuclear war. These are things that I think we ought to be very much concerned about, quite apart from the concern which we ought to feel for the victims uh, in that region itself. That's what I want to say. There's likely to be many, many questions, and we have, as I said, till 10 o'clock. So if it is possible, please Please make your questions as short as you can. Well, I'll start from the left and go across to the right. <laughs> My left. Go ahead. Could you sort of turn toward the audience? Uh, well, okay. <laughs> Go to Iranian would go to pieces. Ah, yeah. After the fourth amendment went to Iran, and this after he went to Iran, which means he doesn't understand what is going on, and he reflects on it. Hmm. How, how America really perceives this area. They don't perceive it correctly. And I'm surprised you haven't mentioned anything about the Iranian hmm. element in the Middle East situation, which is very yeah. important. And I think I agree with you that. Could you hear the, uh, uh, well, let me see if I can re repeat it. You tell me if I'm getting you wrong. Uh, first, uh, I didn't say anything about Iran, which is crucially important in the region. That's correct. Uh, second, he disagrees with what I said about Henry Jackson's, no uh, Senator Jackson's knowing what he's talking about because uh, he didn't understand uh, the nature of the Iranian revolution and so on. Uh, thirdly, uh, he thinks that I'm wrong in saying that the danger in the region is radical Arab nationalism. He thinks it's Islamic fundamentalism, which is incorruptible. <laughs> <laughs>
Is that about, about it? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, about partly I agree. The Iran Iranian story is a very important one, and yes, I should have, you know, if there was a, had been another hour, I would have talked about that. Uh, and yes, that's obviously important. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to talk about it if there's time. As for, as for Jackson, maybe I should clarify. I didn't mean to indicate that he understands the Middle East. I meant that he understands American policy. That's a different thing. And uh, his description of American policy is quite accurate. And I, that your correction is appropriate. I don't think I made that clear. Uh, uh, he, he and everybody else, in fact, just about who in any position of power, misinterpreted and mispredicted what was going to happen in Iran from the CIA all across the board. Uh, and well, if you know anybody who predicted it, I'd like to hear it. Uh, but uh, I haven't come across them. Uh, as far as hmm? predicted that there was going to be a Khomeini uh, victory with the consequences that we've now seen, I'd like a reference for that because I haven't come across. When? <laughs> when? Do you remember when? Pardon? Do you remember when? Yeah, well, roughly. I mean. Within a couple of months, or yeah, I just don't believe. I'll look it up, but I don't believe it. Uh, but okay, you know, there you have a reference you can check. But I, uh, I don't believe it. I found no reference to this anywhere in scholarship or in the media or anywhere else. Uh, as to the uh, nature of Islamic fundamentalism, I agree it's a major issue. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'd use the word incorruptible for it. I think it's a, personally, I think it's an extremely dangerous force. It's kind of an atavistic force, uh, which is leading, which is one of the several f uh, forms of uh, the the theological fanaticism uh, in the region, uh, which is extremely dangerous. I think what's happened in Iran is uh, pretty awful since the Khomeini revolution. The persecution has been terrible, you know. I wouldn't say it's the same as the Shah, but it's very bad. Uh, and uh, these Iranian, uh, and that form of, uh, the, of, of fundamentalist, of fundamentalism is one, it, it instantly spreads over much of the region. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's almost endemic in the Middle East, including by now Israel too, incidentally. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's, but you know, much more serious in the Arab states. And I think it's gonna be, it's, it's very destructive and harmful. Uh, both for the peoples themselves and uh, for the international scene. I mean, that's my opinion about it. I don't know the answer to the second question because I don't know that much about Syria. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting question, but I just don't know. You have to ask somebody who knows more about Syria than I do. Uh, the, uh, I, I know very little, nor do I have been able to find anything rational about the, you know, the internal politics of Syria and the developments there and so on. Uh, as to the first question, why did Nasser end the war of attrition and did uh, al-Fatah support it? Uh, Nasser ended the war of attrition because, uh, he, you know, Egypt was getting smashed. I mean, uh, you know, by then Egypt, uh, Israel was, uh, Israel had gotten phantom jets uh, and they were bombing heavily uh, along the Nile River. According to the Israeli chief of staff, General Gur, uh, about a million and a half people had been driven out of the, uh, Suez, uh, the Suez region uh, and the, you know, the, uh, the major cities were smashed and destroyed and, uh, you know, there was, uh, it was really a disaster. Uh, I think that's why he uh, ended, ended the war of attrition. Uh, as to the Fatah position, I don't really recall to tell you the truth, but I would guess from the logic of it that they probably opposed it. But I don't really recall that you could check. Yeah. Uh, well, let's quickly go over here. <laughs> Primarily. Not always. For example, Nasser was regarded as a very serious threat to Saudi Arabia. Since then. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. There have been a series of coup attempts. In fact, it's very hard to get good information about Saudi Arabia, but for what it's worth, uh, there is a, uh, 
There was an extensive study in a. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to. I'll repeat the question. How come the United States so behave like to Saudi Arabia? And how come you would need such sophisticated weapons to suppress the Right. Yeah, that's a fair question, but I think you misunderstand. But the question was this: If, as I said, the major threat to Saudi Ar to, the, to, to what we call to the Saudi Arabian ruling class is an indigenous uh, nationalist threat, how come the United States sold AWACS to Saudi Arabia? Because obviously they would be totally useless in putting down an internal threat. Well, that's true, uh, but I don't think the AWACS were sold to Saudi Arabia. See, I think the AWACS are prepositioning for the United States of of you know, high-level advanced technology in the event that the United States invades the region. And we... Why sell it? Because we make money by selling it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, look, uh, look, that's very simple. We will, like any other major power, we're going to sell what we can to Saudi Arabia as part of the recycling of petrodollars. Uh, the training, look, they figure it'll be decades before Saudi Arabia could ever run those AWACS, and by then, you know, by the time they get to it, uh, AWACS will be uh, no use anymore and there'll be something else. I mean, the point of the AWACS, which was, I think, com your, your question is completely reasonable on the basis of the press reporting, but uh, uh, what it shows and should show you, I think, is that the press reporting has just completely missed the point of all of this. The point of the AWACS is, and in fact, is the same as the point of our wanting to build up the Egyptian base in Rasmana and our wanting to build up uh, Masira Island off Oman and our wanting to build up Diego Garcia and so on. The United States wants to have a military presence in the Middle East. And uh, part of the military presence is prepositioning. Uh, you know, uh, we, we are going to have, uh, they hope, Reagan, a large part of the current military budget is an effort to uh, uh, develop de techniques for rapid deployment of military forces, but the heavy equipment and the complex equipment, that's basically got to be there. And we are surrounding the Middle East with a whole ring of bases. Uh, another one, uh, an interesting one, is Turkey. Why is the United States so adamant in supporting the military dictatorship of Turkey? You know, brutal military dictatorship. We're strongly supporting it. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned, it's the third highest recipient of military aid. Well, you can't find anything about that in the American press, or at least I can't. Uh, but, for example, there's a rather good article about it by Claudia Wright, who's Washington-based, in, I think, The New Statesman in England, uh, either this week or last week, uh, in which she points out, what is surely true, that the United States is planning to build a rapid deployment force base in eastern Turkey. Turkey is meant as one of the bases for American power. Here, Iran comes in, aimed at Iran and Iraq. And for that reason, we support the military dictatorship. I mean, it's a, Turkey is a, Eastern Turkey is a major, and in fact, you know, it could be that the United States will try to back Kurdish, Kurdish irredentist movements and other things in its effort to try to, you know, reconstruct that region based in Eastern Turkey. But, you know, the AWACS are just part of that whole system. We assume that the Americans will use them. And if the Saudi Arabians want to pay, what was it, $8 billion or something for them, helping the American balance of payments, great, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I would like to object to your falling into the trap that you mentioned yourself. Mm. You said, and it was very popular joke, it would be 10 years before the Saudis could fly the new uh, I recall that at the time the Egyptians took the canal, the populace say they would never be able to run it. The US, mm. And I have no objection, but you have fallen into it. Yeah, trap, I think it's fair. Yeah. I I object to it. Okay, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I still think it's true. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested in the Saudi Arabian Peace Corps. Yeah. I'm interested well, de Gaulle, the uh, question was why, why I think the French-Israeli alliance collapsed in 1967. De, de, de Gaulle, pardon? Yeah, they'd been working with him for a long time. De Gaulle was very strongly opposed to the Israeli invasion, and he uh, made it very clear in no uncertain terms that he was 
he, he made it insistently and openly demanded that Israel not uh, carry out that attack. And when Israel did it, he virtually broke relations. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, but he, I think he was, it was there's an area, Clay Pace, where the documents are very clear. Now, you could ask what lay behind it and so on and so forth. Okay, that's another story, but uh, this part was clear. Uh, let's go, well, somebody in the back, yeah? first question is, did Israel have any options other than being becoming an American client in the early 50s? Uh, well, you know, it's easy to second guess. I should say that there is one major figure who in, is, in the Zionist movement who has claimed that Israel had other options, namely Nahum Goldman, who was the founder of the what was he, World, World Jewish Congress, I think, or something. Well, no, he wasn't the founder. World Jewish Congress, I think. He was founder of the World Jewish Congress and is one of the you know, real grand old figures in world Zionism. And he has argued all along, ever since 1947, that Israel was making a very serious mistake by uh, linking itself so closely to the United States. He argued that Israel should have taken a non-aligned position, uh, and he has always had close relations with, uh, well, you know, I mean, he's very anti-communist, but uh, sort of geopolitically speaking, he's had close relations with the Russians and has claimed, I think, plausibly that the Soviet Union would have continued to support strongly, as they did in the late 40s, uh, a non-aligned Israeli state. And he, he's argued all along that Israel would be much healthier if it had followed that path. Well, I think that's, a, that's an arguable position. I, I think it's right myself. But, you know, it's, you have to, it's, it's not a trivial question. I mean, you have to think of a lot of consequences. Uh, the, uh, as to the second question, Maxim Gilan's idea of an imposed imperial peace if I know what you're talking about, uh, he has suggested that the only, in fact, a lot of Israeli doves, uh, and Gilan is basically one, although he's not in Israel now, uh, have claimed that, have argued that the only hope will be if American power forces a political settlement, because they don't feel that there is any force internal to Israel which could reach the point where it could lead to a political settlement, you know, just out of the internal politics. So they've and a lot of them are in a, you know, a lot of quandary about this because a lot of them are very anti-imperialist, as is Gilan, and many of them are very anti-American. But they're hoping still that the United States will impose, sort of by imperial force, a political settlement on the region because they think that otherwise Israel will inexorably go down the path of annexation and ultimate disaster. And the annexation is going to lead to disaster. I don't think there's much doubt of that. A joint, yeah, right. I mean, that's basically Geneva. You know, what, he, what he's talking about is a Geneva conference, which would involve the Soviet Union and the United States and maybe marginally Europe, which would enact the international consensus. But what that means is the, the United States, because the United States has, in fact, been blocking, you know, the whole point of Camp David was to block such an arrangement. And in fact, crucially, the United States, as I indicated in these remarks, has been standing in the way of such a settlement. So yeah, sure, it would be international, but the primar primary issue is would the United States change its position and impose basically by force a political settlement on Israel? And a lot of Israeli doves do hope for that and have said so. Uh, somebody over here, I'll come back to everybody, but let's go around the room, yeah, yeah. 
What is a dangerous position? The whole situation is dangerous, yeah. Okay. Weakness of whom? Yeah, okay. For the liberation movements, I mean, for the liberation movements themselves, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, one thing to re I, you know, I think that raises a whole lot of, you know, too many questions to talk about, but, uh, and very interesting ones, but uh, one thing to remember first, just to clarify, is that the liberate, so-called liberation movements basically don't give a damn about international affairs. You know, they're interested in their own local problem. So they couldn't care less what the impact will be on the international system of their solving their problem. There are some exceptions, but basically this is true of what we call national liberation movements, or what they call national liberation movements. So I think, uh, yeah, what effect would it, if these movements come to, say, rely on the Soviet Union in our sphere or on us in their sphere, uh, there are two separate questions. One is, what will the impact be of this on the international system? And the second is, what will the impact be on them? Uh, and let me just concentrate on the second. I think the impact on them will be will be destructive. Uh, if, uh, but nevertheless, they often don't have any options. I mean, uh, they often do not have any options other than to rely somehow on the superpower, which is not the one that's trying to smash them. Now, uh, the the long-term effects of that, if they're victorious, are very dangerous, are very bad. Uh, you take the case of Vietnam. Say, Vietnam was compelled to rely on China and the Soviet Union. They always expected, all, I don't understand how American analysts couldn't understand this, it was transparent throughout the war that Vietnam regarded China as its greatest potential enemy. No visitor to Hanoi could have possibly missed that, unless they were really dense. Uh, and uh, yes, that's exactly what happened afterwards, and it happened for intelligent, perfectly understandable reasons. Just look at the relation of those two countries. I mean, it's very similar to the Russia-Yugoslavia relation. Uh, now, now uh, Vietnam has essentially been compelled to rely solely on the Soviet Union for support. It's very destructive. They're trying to do everything they can to break out of that relationship, and the United States is trying very hard to keep them in it. You know, uh, and it's. Uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons. For one thing, we can then scream about how they're a Russian satellite and that justifies our you know, efforts to block aid to them and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, it's clear that this is, a very, this is far from beneficial to them and they understand that and they've been trying to break out of it. In fact, Cuba's trying to break out of it. You know, one of the reasons why Cuba uh, apparently, uh, why Castro strongly urged the Sandinistas to maintain a uh, position of openness to both sides is that he had experience with what happens when a third world liberation movement is compelled, in this case compelled by the United States, and I suspect by design, to become uh, a unique, you know, to become a Soviet satellite. Very destructive. They can't offer them the kind of thing, you know, they will not offer them, They even if they wanted to, they couldn't offer them the, the ways of uh, uh, economic and social development that are necessary for a third world country. And, you know, if the Afghans were, say, to, you know, resist Soviet aggression and become American clients, well, a similar story in reverse. It's a very dangerous position, but you've got to remember that these movements have very few options. I mean, they're not like the United States. You know, they're not world dominant powers. They're, they're you know, they, they, these are movements of extremely oppressed people with very few resources at their, uh, at their hands, fighting enormous powers bent on their destruction. I mean, it's not like, say, the American Revolution, you know, which was basically a war between France and England with Washington's troops kind of tagging along at the side, and neither of them very powerful. That's not the world situation now. You know, the world situation now is major superpowers, you know, trying to crush uh, 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 extremely impoverished peoples with very few resources, you know, and their options are extremely limited and they're naturally going to go to support where they can get it.
von Pardon? I didn't understand. Oh, thanks. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The American Arms Corporations. Do the, if I, if I, if the question is this, do the American Arms Corporations have an interest in maintaining the level of conflict? Do they set goals of their own that are, have to do with weapon sales that are independent of the government? Uh, I, my feeling is that the American, by and large, the American arms producers are virtually nationalized. I mean, uh, our system is one with private profit and, you know, uh, nationalized industries with private profit. I think that's basically what the uh, arms sales are. I mean, I think if you look in, you know, in detail, you might find conflicts between, say, Lockheed and the government. But I, I really think that, you know, you really look in detail, yeah, you'll find conflicts. But overwhelmingly, these just, you know, they're instruments of the state. These companies couldn't survive for a minute uh, without, you know, state purchases. And, uh, and in fact, they're just, they're really just, Com companies where, where, where you know, they're, they're, they are just what I described. I mean, they're basically part of the na of the state, the state component of the state capitalist mix with the profit privatized. That's true. Given the, the amount of money involved, how can you justify any interest? It doesn't. I mean, the only interest that the United States has in peace is that we're afraid of the consequences of war. See, the United States does not. I mean, look, no power really wants war. We would like to gain our objectives peacefully. The United States, I say we, the U.S. government would like to attain its objectives peacefully, of course, because war is, a, you know, very dangerous, especially these days. I mean, any war in some, you know, the, the level of force is such that any local conflagration in the South Atlantic or, you know, you name it, that could blow up to a world war. And, you know, the people who own the world don't want to see it go, you know. Uh, so therefore, they'd preserve, to, they'd like to... Uh, you know, they would like to see things settled by force, but they have no real commitment to peace. You know, if, they, if their objectives require force, they'll use force, you know. Yeah, um, you just mentioned the issue that national liberation movement and our extensive race against global countries. That what? And to a great extent, global countries are primarily interested in the low-price government of the community. Yeah. And yet, in the last, I don't know, 10 or more years, there is uh, you know, great outside around the world against society. And I'm wondering to what extent you feel that outside against Israel is based A, on actual injustice perpetrated by Israel, B, like, continuing them to uh, direct, you know, motion away from Arab financial systems, C, whatever else. Hmm. I think all of those factors enter, uh, and they enter in different mix for, in different places. Uh, but let's say, but the, the main thing, and I think, see, don't forget that, that this, uh, you're right that this has intensified in the last years, but it was going, it's been going, it's been building up since 67. Uh, and in fact, say, take the relations of Israel to black Africa. Uh, in, uh, it, see, this is usually described with the relations, technically the relations broke. In fact, the economic relations have been maintained and even expanded. But uh, 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 this is usually described as the result of Arab oil pressure. And that may have been a factor, but I think it was a very small one. And you can see it by looking at the development in detail. For example, President Senghor of Senegal, who was very pro-Israel, uh, led a uh, uh, sort of a peace mission of African states in, I think, 1972, uh, which went to Israel and, uh, and the Arab states and came back with the belief that they had reached agreement on, uh, on, a, well, on what I call the international consensus, that kind of settlement. And then uh, they proposed it internationally, I think at the UN, and Israel rejected it, and they felt that they had had the rug pulled out from under them, and they were very bitter and said so. This is before the oil prices, this is before oil politics or anything. And th th this is one case. Now, see, the, the fact of the matter that you have, to, I mean, there's a lot of opportunism, opportunism in this and a lot of cynicism in it and so on and so forth, no question about that. But one thing which you must bear in mind if you want to understand it is that the, if the third world is not unified on very much, but they are unified on anti-colonialism. That is, they are unified, the, the one thing in which there is general unity, uh, 
uh, is opposition to a European power occupying and controlling an area of the third world as they see it. That's why you have the Latin American reaction to the South Atlantic dispute. Okay, You can argue about it how you feel, but the fact is that overwhelmingly in Latin America, from left to right, there's just a tremendous degree of unity in opposition to England on this. And the reason is, you can, you know, you can like it or not, but they perceive it as a case of European uh, domination of a third world territory. Now, the Israeli occupation, see, they react very different. Uh, it, see, in, in fact, occupations by, uh, well, we, you know, it, European occupations, and they regard Israel as a European power, uh, are intolerable to most of the third world for reasons you can perfectly well understand from their own history. And I think that's been a dominant element. The other factors you mentioned have also entered. Yeah. The problem with what do you do about people who, you know, less than four years ago were among the most, you know, oppressed and in the world, which is the you know, near What do you do with thought problems people have more like yeah. Yeah. No, no, okay. Yeah, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, what was justice, sort of? Yeah. Right. Well, uh, I mean, frankly, I don't think there's any answer to that question, to tell you the truth. I mean, I think it was, a, you know, it was a question of competing rights. But to that question, there are a lot of questions... I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you. I'll explain to you. Uh, the reason is, yeah, there are some questions that have answers. And may I answer his question, and then later you can ask your question. May I ask? May I answer his question? Okay. His question was, what I, if I understood it, what I think would have been real justice in, say, 1948. Okay? And it seems to me you can make a very... Uh, there, there are many questions that have answers and plausible answers, and this is one that I really don't think does. Uh, the tr fact of the matter is that there were competing claims, and each of them is quite legitimate in its own terms, but they just happen to be conflicting. Now, sometimes that happens. Look, will you, let, will you keep quiet and let me answer his question? Look, you will have a chance to make your speech in a minute. He asked a question, and he has a right to an answer, okay? Uh, now, in this case, I think... Will you let him... You haven't? Okay. Uh, now... Uh, okay. You, uh, you'll be the next person I'll call on, okay? You'll be the next person I call on. Let me respond to his question, okay? Uh, the, uh, uh, what I think is what Americans have failed to do, I think. See, I think by and large we have understood, Americans have understood the Jewish claim. They have failed to understand the Palestinian claim. And I think they ought to. Because you will have your chance, okay? Uh, the, uh, now, the, the Palestinian claim is really a very simple one. Uh, they did not see what moral imperative there was for them to give up their land uh, in response to the crimes of the Germans. Now that's pretty simple, you know. <laughs> look, look, look. I, think, I think we should at least be able to understand that. Okay, but now that's a question about history. Now we're talking about the world as it exists today. You know, we could have various discussions about what should have happened, but we now live in the world that exists today. And as far as the world exists today is concerned, it seems to me, as I've probably suggested, that there is really no alternative uh, other than continued conflict, war, uh, destruction, and ultimately nuclear war. There's no alternative to the international consensus. I think it's an ugly solution, but I think it's the only one. Now, would you like to make your speech, please? Yeah. Why don't you now get up and make your speech, and that'll be it. All right, raise your question.
Okay, next question. <laughs> Come on, everybody's allowed to have their chance to speak, okay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard it, and you asked me if I would answer that question, and the answer is no, I won't. It's a different topic, because it's a different topic. Yeah. Well, I'm also skeptical. The question is uh, that many people are, are skeptical about the impact of public opinion on American foreign policy, and I seem to be saying it could have an impact, and could I elaborate on that? Is that the question? Well, I'm also skeptical. I mean, I think that, but, you know, I don't believe, I don't, believe, I don't think the pluralist picture is correct. I don't think it's true that foreign policy emerges as a kind of a vector from various, you know, forces of public opinion. I don't think that's true. I think foreign policy basically reflects the interests of dominant groups and those groups uh, mean and primarily of groups that have their power in the domestic economy. Nevertheless, you know, this is far from a totalitarian state and the fact of the matter is that public opinion does have an impact. Uh, in particular, it has an impact in the following kind of situation. When there's a range of policies, all of them more or less consistent with the interests of the dominant ruling groups, in that case, public opinion may have an impact in choosing among them. So, for example, take the Vietnam War. Now, uh, the, the, in my view, the, I think the peace movement was very successful. Not successful enough, but very successful. That is, it was one of the, it, it put its weight behind a retraction of American power and violence from Indochina. Not before it enabled the United States to destroy the society, but anyway, it did something. Okay, that's important. A lot of people are alive because of that. Now, did that mean that American, why, why could it do it? The reason is that Indochina was a pretty peripheral issue from the point of view of American imperialism. I mean, the United States could mean, it was crucial for the United States that Indochina not succeed. It was very crucial for the United States that Indochina not be a social and economic success under national communist rule. That was crucial. And if you look at, say, the Pentagon Papers in the early years, you'll discover that, I think that the way I read them, that that was the central issue. They were afraid of what they called the domino effect and that really meant the demonstration effect of successful development. Uh, well, the United States won that war. I mean, uh, Indochina was badly enough demolished so that the chances that it'll be a success are very slight. And in South Vietnam, which was the main target of the American attack, the United States won the war flat out. I mean, we simply destroyed the National Liberation Front, which we recognized always, the United States always recognized, let's say, take Douglas Pike, who I was just told recently is at this university, uh, who was an American government specialist on the Viet Cong. You take a look at his book, The Viet Cong, written in 1966, which I would regard basically as an American government propaganda tract, but it's nevertheless that of a leading American specialist on the Viet Cong. And what he says there is that it was ludicrous for anybody to talk about uh, the United States, about the American-sponsored regime entering into a coalition with the National Liberation Front, because he says that would be like a minnow entering into a coalition with a whale. Okay, that was why it was ludicrous to talk about elections and democracy and all this business, because obviously our minnow couldn't enter into coalition with the southern whale. Well, okay, we killed the southern whale. You know, the net of the the attack on South Vietnam and the you know the especially the accelerated pacification campaign and the rest of it, uh, the net effect, and the Phoenix and all that business. The net effect was that the National Liberation Front was essentially demolished, with the predictable consequence, perfectly obvious by 1969 or 1970, like. I was predicting it, other people were in print, predictable consequence that North Vietnam would take over because nothing else would be left. Well, that's what happened. And that gave a tremendous, first of all, that meant that the, the danger of successful development uh, was eliminated. And of course, it gives an added, uh, to, to the super cynical hypocrites in the American propaganda system, it gives another gift because they can now refer to the North Vietnamese takeover, which is the direct consequence of the destruction of South Vietnam that they backed as a reason for having destroyed South Vietnam. This is unique in the history of imperialist cynicism, in my view. Uh, I don't know, can't think of anything like it, but that's what's going on in the United States today, okay, with no dissent, for vocal dissent. Okay, all, all that work, but you know, that's, to get back to the main point, this, the United States basically could succeed in its major objective and abandon its minor objective of actually controlling Indochina. 
Okay, because the, the uh, peace movement was maneuvering in that area between alternatives all more or less acceptable to dominant um, American groups, it could succeed. Similarly in this case, uh, I, I think, as I said, that the, the Rogers plan or the Kissinger plan are both more or less consistent with American imperial interests. As a result, public opinion can make a big difference. Now, on the other hand, if we were to pick an example where, uh, you know, which was really crucial, say, to the, to the needs of dominant groups, ruling groups, if you like, in the United States, public opinion in itself would have very little impact. I mean, it would take something like a war, you know, class war or something to have an impact. But we're not talking about that kind of case. And I think that's the difference. Yeah, could you say that, uh, okay. in your opinion, the real reason why the U.S., the most significant reason why the U.S. supports Israel is because Israel is very radical in the Arab You know, it seems to me that the land of Israel creates more problems than it's supposed to solve. Israel is not an asset to the U.S. There's certain good side effects that you mentioned in the other way, but. In uh, the Middle East, it allows for the very Soviet penetration that the U.S. is trying to do. Well. The radical lines of the Arabs, uh, you know, these Arabs, these Saudis, are worried about worried about the Palestinian ministry. Yes. No, they're not worried about it. They advocate it. Okay. They're concerned about it. They advocate it. They advocate a Palestinian ministry. Yeah. But would there be Palestinians to contain if the U.S. had not engaged? Would there be Palestinians to, unless you kill them all, they're going to be Palestinians to contain, yeah. If the U.S. had not what? If the U.S. had not backed Israel all these years. Would there have been Palestinians? I don't understand. I mean, I understand all the question up to the last sentence. Would, would you have a situation where there would, where you have a, you know, a so-called problem the U.S. would have to deal You mean if the U.S. had backed the international consensus, would there be a Palestinian problem? I don't think so. But look, look. I think the point you're making is quite sensible, and in fact, it's one of the major points that appears in American policy planners' debates. For example, if you look at, say, the Brookings Institute report, uh, it basically takes the line you just took. It says that uh, whereas it had been believed that Israel was a strategic asset which could stand against uh, radical nationalism like it did against Nasser and so on, now it's creating more problems for us than it's worth, and what we ought to do is resolve the problem, and in fact it's the displaced Palestinians that are causing the inflaming the, radi the you know, radical currents in the, in the Arab world, and what we should do is lock them into a, this little mini-state where they'll stop where the trouble will stop. That's in fact the logic behind the Rogers plan. And in fact, now I think uh, most of the ruling groups in the Arab world accept that logic, like Saudi Arabia accepts that logic. And I think, as I said, I think the Reagan administration is torn. For example, I, think, I, pro I suspect that Weinberger accepts that logic. I think Haig doesn't. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, if, you, if you accept the premises of American policy, you drop all moral considerations, you drop all considerations about human consequences or anything like that, and you just look at the question of pure, how do you extend and implement American power? That's the only question you ask. I think it's arguable, you know. I think it's arguable whether the best way to do it is by relying on a our very powerful Spartan militaristic state, which will crush all potential enemies, one possibility, or whether you kind of eliminate potential en enemies by giving them a little bit of what they want and enclosing them in some territory where they can be controlled. That's arguable. And I think that's exactly why there's an argument. You know? uh, I'm afraid only one last question, so why don't you pick? So, uh, let me look very uh, anxious. Okay. <laughs> As for what the allies are dying to intellectually terrorize and people, especially Jews in the country, there's a whole ocean that they can get get to them into a total dialogue. So I don't take very strong exception to your support of the plan that you yourself have been committed to the interests of uh, North Korea and European imperialism and the gas area of the state. The two state solution, you mean? Yeah, with mm -hmm. uh, basically, yeah. Uh, it's Why do I support it if, yeah? It would be the impact of uh, a client state, a client yeah okay we're talking about different time spans I mean you know I, in, in, I, I agree with you I think we're agreed on a lot I mean I think we're agreed that this two-state settlement, which I think is the best of a lot of bad options at the moment, will be very ugly. Uh, 
and it'll have nothing to do with liberation or socialism or anything like that. You know, it's okay. It's so why should we advocate it? Well, because the alternatives are worse, and because uh, and I think all the alternatives are worse, as far as I can see. If you can name one, okay. Uh, but uh, and what could come out of it? Well, I don't think that's the end of history. Incidentally, I don't think history ends. Suppose that the United States joins the international consensus and Israel goes along and we get a two-state settlement, which in my view will be very ugly for the reasons you mentioned and others. That's not the end of history. Oh, but it, it's certainly not a, it's, there's nothing, you know, nothing in the nation state system is ever a real solution, nor is this. Uh, but what it'll be is a step, you know, and uh, in my view, the next step that ought to take place is, uh, and again, you know, partial solution is some kind of move towards uh, kind of a federal federalism between the two states. Fine, yeah, I'm coming to that. And in the in the context of, but you know, it's okay to wave a hand and say let's have socialist revolution and all be happy. But you know, how do you do it? Okay, uh, fine. Let, how do you do it is the question. Well, you know, if you think it through, it seems to me. I mean, that's quite serious. You know, let's think in the longer terms uh, in this region, or for that matter, in any region. You know, I don't want to limit it to that. Uh, it seems to me that in the territory of the former Palestine, the former Palestine of the Mandate, which is now going to be a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, two discriminatory states based on hatred of the neighbor and so on and so forth. It's not very pretty. You know, two Ulsters, if you like. Uh, and what can come out of that? Well, I think one thing that come out can come out is that as the level of tension and conflict reduces, as I think it would, other sorts of interests will begin to emerge, which are not national interests. After all, people are not only identified on sort of national religious lines, you know. Not all, that's not all, a lot of other identifications, like class identifications, and in a context, and others, you know. And uh, in a context of lowering tensions, I think that other forms of human association can emerge, which will cross national lines, and will lay a basis for uh, an association that I think would be much more beneficial, even if, even if people continue to identify themselves in national terms, and that's their choice, not mine, you know, uh, namely some kind of federal solution based on real parity, not federalism with one dominating the other, but real federalism. And that's not the end either. You know, if in fact there is, let's say, a move towards association on other lines, which could be a move towards some kind of socialist development, well, fine, that's all to the good, and I think that could lead to a submerging of the national conflict and confrontation into a real, you know, sort of socialist binationalism. I think that's possible, you know. But these are long-term things, and I think that the two-state two settlement is a very ugly solution. I agree with you on that, but I do think it's the best of the existing short-term possibilities. Well, I've been told that this is the last... Let me just say one thing. Uh, I, I'm sorry about one thing. I was hoping somebody would bring up the questions that were passed out of the door, because it would have been very revealing you learn a lot about Stalinist-style propaganda systems if I'd had a chance to go through the, you know, the lies and falsehoods that are included in that. But since nobody raised it, I'm going to do it.